Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's a pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Chaba um, Asabaswari, who is a professor at the University of Alberta. Um, he has worked on uh, have worked a lot on reinforcement learning, multi embedded and statistical learning theory. And today he's going to talk about uh, sparse contextual uh, sparse banded problems. Yeah. Contextual or not, sparsity is going to be there. Uh, sparse context, very sparse. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm going to be here for four months. So any time you knock on my door, send me an email, uh, I will be very more happy to talk to, uh, to any of you. Uh, so this joint work with uh, my former student, Yasin Abbas Yatkori, who is a, a um, postdoctor fellow with uh, Peter Bartlett right now, and David Pan, who is at Google at the moment. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about is online to confidence at conversions and application to sparse stochastic bandits. And uh, okay, so here's the contents. Uh, so first, we're going to talk about linear bandits. How many of you are familiar with linear bandits? Okay, uh, we will have some motivation, uh, but like maybe we can cut it a little bit shorter. Uh, so why should we care? How come um, we should care about sparsity? How, how does sparsity come into the picture? Uh, and then I'm going to talk about uh, a general type of ergotum and uh, how it actually just reduces the problem of designing bandit ergotum for the stochastic setting to designing tight confidence sets uh, for certain uh, prediction problems. And uh, the associated regret bonds. So that's a, a general result. Uh, and then uh, we're going to talk about, for this particle linear prediction problems, how to construct uh, these confidence sets or confidence regions. And uh, here it's important to, to remark that as opposed to many works in statistics, uh, we need uh, what's called honest confidence sets, which means that uh, if you declare that the true unknown parameter is in your confidence set with a certain probability, it has to be there. Uh, with that probability, it's not an asymptotic result. So these are finite time uh, results that, that you need. Uh, so we'll uh, first define what this problem is. Uh, and then I'm going to argue that these confidences actually do matter a lot uh, from the perspective of, of practical, obtaining practically good results. And uh, then I'm going to jump into uh, the main part of the talk. Uh, which is a new construction for uh, confidence sets. We call it online to confidence set conversion. Uh, it takes an online ergotum for an adversarial setting and it uh, converts it into a confidence set. It's kind of uh, a neat result. So for that, we're going to talk about the adversarial framework, this online linear prediction problem. And then we just look at the conversion and then I'm going to explain the slide why it works. Uh, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk about application to linear bandits uh, in particle to sparse linear bandits, which is the main topic. Uh, look at the results. Okay, so linear bandits. Uh, so I don't have to explain this uh, to you. This is actually uh, from a paper co-authored by Li Hong. Uh, you want to uh, recommend uh, news articles uh, to users coming to your website, and the news article could be something, uh, oops, uh, yes, the leader pointer doesn't work, uh, something like uh, this, or it could be about politics, uh, or it could be about you know, uh, computer games, or it could be uh, about the Olympics, uh, or it could be about science and so on and so forth. So there's zillions of articles that the user could be interested in, and you want to put the, the article on the front that matters the most to the user, and you're hoping to collect clicks. Okay, so, so here the, the goal is to maximize what's called the, the click-through rate. Okay, so how does this work? So you have a number of rounds, and users coming to your website, 
and in round t you're given a set of articles d of t. Okay, so given uh, the set of articles, you have to choose one article, we are going to denote it by xt uh, to put it on the front uh, of the web page, and uh, you're going to receive a reward of one if the user clicks on the article, otherwise uh, you don't receive a reward. And your goal is to maximize the total reward. So uh, how are we going to deal with uh, large action, action sets? So we have this article, for example. So this is just one of the many uh, possible articles. You could have zillions of articles in your database. And so how to generalize to uh, articles that you have never shown to the, the users? Uh, and one of the uh, possibilities is to, to work out some features for the articles, as we all know. Uh, so we can ask uh, whether the article is about sport, and in this case it's yes, where, whether it's about politics, and in this case it's no, whether it's about Olympics, and in this case it's yes, and whether it's about games, in this case it's no, whether it's about science, in this case it's no, uh, whether this is a trending on our article, and let's say it's trending article, and so on and so forth, so you can cook up your features. In this case, these features would be binary, and you can collect the answers and code them with uh, numbers, uh, like 0, 1 numbers, and then you can collect them into a vector. That will be the feature vector underlying your article. And for every article you can do this, this way turning uh, uh, the problem into a problem that is defined over some vector space of dimension d. So this is the number of features. Uh, and then the probability of a click on x could be modeled uh, by, let's say, a simple linear model. So you just uh, linearly combine uh, the, the features of the article, and that gives the probability of a click. And uh, I'm going to use this notation for denoting the inner product of this uh, theta vector and, and the, the vector x. And so the click is going to be a Bernoulli random variable, and we're going to assume that this p of x, for some magical reason, lies between 0 and 1, and the probability of a click is, is just p of x. Okay. Uh, so you can alternatively write this in the following way. Uh, if you define eta as a difference between y and, and p of x, then you can write that the click is equal to the inner product plus this eta, but eta is just the noise. So if you take the expectation of eta, it's, it's a zero mean random variable. Okay, uh, are we good? So far so good, right? So, uh, more generally and more abstractly, linear bandit problems are, are defined over uh, some vector space of, let's say, uh, finite dimension d. Uh, and uh, in this case, let's uh, assume that this is a Euclidean vector space. And uh, we have an unknown but fixed weight vector that I'm going to denote by theta of star. And the game is played in these rounds. In, in round t, you're receiving a convex set d of t. So why can I assume that you receive a convex set? Because you could randomize, and it's randomization. You can always achieve uh, any point uh, that is in a convex hull of the original set. Okay? In terms of the expected uh, uh, return, expected reward, nothing changes if you introduce this randomization. Okay, so you're going to receive a convex set D of T. You can think about this as the set of articles. And then you have to choose an action, X of T, in, in this uh, convex set. And you're going to receive this reward, which is the random variable, which depends on the inner product of the action that you have chosen and the unknown parameter vector. And some noise is uh, confounding uh, this inner product. And we're going to assume that this noise is, is a zero mean noise, by which we mean that if you take the expectation of the noise condition on everything that you have seen up to that point, like all the previous actions and uh, all the previous uh, clicks then, uh, or, or rewards, uh, then the expectation is just zero. And we're going to assume, of course, that uh, uh, the noise has uh, control tests as well. And the goal is to maximize total expected reward. Okay, so that's just the standard framework. Uh, that just introduces my notation for this framework. So why linear bandits? Well, it's, it's like you can see, it's, it's a beautiful uh, model, uh, and it's also very general. It allows you to model the dependency between the rewards of arms, and hence deal with large action sets. Uh, you can model Martian bandits with even infinitely many arms uh, with it. 
Uh, you can model a lot of other interesting games like combinatorial trio games, uh, interactive learning, and it has a bunch of applications, user interface optimization, that's what we started with, online product recommendation, even this matrix prediction problems can be put into this form. So it's kind of cool, network routing, and so on and so forth. So uh, the list continues. There are uh, tons of applications. OK, uh, so how do we evaluate a learner? Well, the learner is evaluated in terms of the regret. Since we allow the action set to change every time step, we have to uh, a little bit uh, be careful about how we define the regret. So if we knew theta star in any ways, then in round t, we would choose this action, right? So that maximizes the expected reward. No question about it. Like everyone would do that. And so uh, our regret is how much uh, we lose by not doing this on, on uh, expectation, if you wish. So there's some people call this pseudo regret because you're not co uh, comparing the actual reward, but you're com comparing their uh, condition expectation given the past and given the choices. Anyway, so, so here is the total uh, pseudo, re pseudo reward that you're going to receive up to round n, and here is what you could have achieved if you knew theta star. Okay? Uh, and so that defines your regret, and we want the regret to uh, go to zero as fast as possible. Um, sorry, if you divide the regret by the number of rounds, we want uh, this quantity, the average regret, to go to zero as fast as possible. Uh, because this would mean that, well, the average reward uh, that you could have obtained is close to the average reward that you actually obtained. Yes? So the real regret would be just the zero one submissions. Right, right. So, yeah, that would be that. So I mean, like, if you are interested in expected reward, then there is no difference. If you're interested in deviation bonds, like high probability bonds and the regret, then there is a slight difference between the two. Yeah. I'm sorry, could you show me the definition of theta star again? Uh, theta star is just uh, like the problem definition, you mean? Yeah, so where, where is theta star generation? Yeah. It's like you, you have this unknown vector theta star, <coughs> and the reward is the inner product uh, of your choice with theta star, which is this unknown vector, plus some noise. So if you take the expected reward, this is the expected reward, right? Because we said that the noise has uh, a zero mean. So we so assume in the construction that indeed the payoffs are being generated by a linear model. Yeah, Why are you competing against the best no. linear model? Yeah, no. First. Okay. Okay. The first, yeah. So in the stochastic linear setting, this, this is the, the assumption. So if the model is not correct, then uh, whatever I say here, you, you can throw it out of the window. You are going to have a linear regret in that case. Anyways, uh, but still you could study that case, right? So but it's, it's outside the scope of this talk. OK. Good. OK, so we want the average regret to go to zero as fast as possible, or we don't want the regret to grow faster than at the linear rate. We want sublinear regret growth. Uh, so uh, when do we say that we, we have a sparse linear bandit problem? Well, it's obvious when theta star is sparse. Uh, uh, so the hope here is that sparsity is going to allow one to add many features without slowing down learning, right? So in this uh, news article recommendation example, for example, you're just cooking up these features, and then you're hoping to capture everything that uh, could possibly influence the reward. But if you start to add too many features, and that inevitably slows down learning, isn't it? Well, except that maybe if many of the features are irrelevant to your prediction, therefore their coefficients could be taken to be zero, because other features already capture those things, and you don't have to be that careful uh, about how you're constructing your features, it's, it's a good thing if you can exploit sparsity. Okay, uh, so there is a difference here between a sparse parameter vector versus uh, sparse features. You could use sparse features to uh, like uh, design different algorithms, speed up your algorithms. Uh, these problems are just like orthogonal to each other. And of course, uh, if you have both of them, then you can look into the intersection and that's a, an interesting realm to be. But I'm not going to talk about uh, that. I'm just going to talk about the sparse parameter vector case about uh, today. 
OK, uh, so how do we uh, play in stochastic linear bandits? Well, one of the standard uh, uh, algorithms uh, uses what's called optimism in the face of uncertainty principle. And uh, the way it works is that you maintain a high probability confidence set about the unknown uh, parameter vector. Okay? So this confidence set is, is a region in, in RD. And with high probability, it contains the unknown uh, parameter vector theta star. And the algorithm is just like this one line. So that's the beauty of this thing. Uh, so you just take uh, the joint maximizer of the inner product, where the first, uh, first uh, component is, is your action x, and the second one is the, the parameter vector. And the first component belongs to uh, the actual action set, and the second component belongs to the confidence set that you have at that moment in time. Okay. Uh, so this way, you are looking at a word, uh, at the best possible word. You are hoping for the best to see the best possible word, and you are playing the best possible arm in the best possible word. So you are optimistic. Okay. So this way, uh, theta tilde uh, t is going to be an optimistic, we are going to call it an optimistic estimate of the unknown parameter vector theta star. And this uh, principle goes back to at least Loy and Robbins, uh, maybe even before that. And uh, there are a lot of algorithms uh, like UCB1, uh, uh, which uh, was proposed by uh, our Chiesa Bianchi and Fisher and Shapira. And that's a special case, and that's not the right reference. But anyways, uh, and it's, it's a widely uh, applied uh, principle, and, and uh, it's, it's very actively researched. So you might worry about uh, the implementation of this, but if you have a finite action set, then you can just like enumerate all the actions, and then for all the actions you can compute its optimistic reward. That's, uh, uh, if your confidence set has some nice shape, then that's going to be a convex optimization problem, so you can do that. It's not a big deal. Uh, I say if the number of uh, actions is, is becoming really large, then you have to be a little bit more organized about this computation, but I say, like, I'm going to sweep this under the rug. Just move on. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's an interesting problem on its own of how to actually uh, compute these things. Uh, so this is just an illustration of what's going on. So you have this confidence set C of t at time t. And so theta star must be inside somewhere. And uh, usually theta hat of t, which is an estimate of the unknown parameter vector, is kind of the center of this. And then usually this is an ellipsoidal shape. And theta tilde uh, is going to be on the boundary because you're, minimi you're maximizing a linear objective over this uh, confidence set. OK, uh, so that's, that's kind of the picture that you should have in mind. Uh, and uh, so uh, why does it work? So how does the, uh, the, the analysis look like? And uh, you can actually analyze the immediate regret of, of this algorithm, and it goes as follows. So in, in round t, you're choosing this action, and you should have chosen that action. Okay? And so this is your uh, pseudo reward for that round, and this is, the ma this is the best possible pseudo reward. So you have to use the theta star, the unknown parameter vector, when analyzing the regret. And so this can obviously be upper bounded uh, by this quantity y, because uh, we are guaranteed that theta star belongs to the confidence set. And of course, this belongs to the decision set at time t. And this is maximizing uh, this inner product over the, the cross product of the decision set and confidence set. So this is at least as large as the other quantity. So this, is, uh, this just follows because of the optimistic choice. And if you look at this well, by linearity, and you can introduce some norm and some dual norm, you can just use Herder's inequality, you get this, this inequality. So what you see there is that you have the freedom to choose any norm. And uh, the regret at time t is going to depend on uh, the dual norm of the uh, parameter vector that you choose. And so if uh, you know the the D of T set has uh, some nice shape, it's, it's nice bonded, and this is going to be bonded quantity. This other quantity is, is more interesting, right? So that's the difference between theta star 
and your optimistic estimate of theta star at time t. So if that difference cannot be big, then you will be in a good shape. Okay? So you want to choose uh, this norm in such a way that you can show that this difference shrinks. Okay, so that's, that's the whole deal. Okay, so in some sense, this difference is going to measure the confidence, uh, is, go going, to, is go going to measure the size of uh, the confidence set, and, and you can think about it as a confidence width. Uh, and uh, we can use different norm in every time step, and indeed for a tight analysis, you would do that. Okay, so uh, from this, you can derive various regret bonds. So I'm, I'm going to show some regret bonds, but like, this is just the basic idea of how the analysis goes. Uh, and so why optimism? So could you get away without optimism? Uh, well, actually, you can get away without optimism. Uh, so this was uh, the previous analysis. But if you choose any theta tilde t, that is an element of the confidence at c of t, okay? and then you choose uh, the maximizing vector with respect to your chosen parameter vector within the confidence. And then, well, with trivial manipulation, you can get this other inequality. This other inequality looks very much like the previous inequality, except for the appearance of this term. So you, what you see is that what the optimistic choice buys you is that you don't have to analyze this term. And uh, this term might actually be, be large or, or, or small. Anyways, the optimistic choice kind of just like shapes up this term. So that's, that's what, uh, what you gain. But if you really worry about you know, how expensive this optimistic choice is, how ex expensive it is to calculate, then maybe you can go with some other choice and then just analyze that. Like for finite and bandits, you, you, can, you can actually analyze it, do that. OK, so, so far so good. So we see that it's, uh, yeah. Could you go back? Uh, so um, if you pick uh, any element from C, then <coughs> that inequality holds, but it, does, it doesn't necessarily help you in terms of learning. Yeah, that's right. So if, if, you're not, if you cannot show that you're controlling this term, this is the new term, then it doesn't help you. Right? So you can control this term as before, and this term is, is, is as before. This is the only difference. That is the new term. And if you think about finite and bandits, in finite and bandits, you can actually control that term. Uh, for the other type of bandits, I don't know. Actually, it's, it's a, an interesting question whether you can control it. it it's a meaningful term, actually. So just to make sure that I understand. So, the, so x, uh, t star, this is a constant thing that doesn't change across the rounds. But the norm, the dual norm, is something that could change. From yeah, yeah. It, it should be indexed by t, yeah. Just in one, two. Huh. But yeah, but so if you have the same. No, why, is x, why is x star t indexed by t? It's x because the decision, I allow the decision set to change by time. So in my model, every time step, you receive a decision set, d of t, which is a convex set, the Euclidean space. Okay. So the set of articles every, t every round is different. Okay. It's, it's coming from there. This way, you, you actually kind of mother contact your bandits, too, if you're thinking about it. Uh, so, but if you don't have that changing decision set that this index would go away, you would have an index there. And this would actually measure how confident you are about the reward of the optimal arm. And you can, if you can show that that shrinks fast, too, then you would be done. OK. Uh, so where do the confidence sets come from? Uh, it, we see that it's, uh, it's, it's all about the design of the confidence sets. Like once you have the good confidence sets, then, then you have good regret. So we hope that the cat is not going to have any regret. With high probability. With high probability, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's better to go with honest confidence sets in this case, maybe even be a little bit risk sensitive, I would suggest. Okay. But anyways, uh, so let's be honest. So how do we design these honest confidence sets? Uh, so if you look at the problem in a general way, you have uh, this linear prediction problem. So there are these coverits, x1, xn, y1, and n. Those are the responses. Uh, you happen to choose in coverits. Those are your action in the previous case. But more generally, they could come from any sequential procedure. 
And then you assume that the response is a linear function of the covariates with an unknown vector, and you have some, some noise. And then here I'm being more specific about what do I assume about the noise. You could assume that the noise is, is uh, sub-Gaussian uh, with some constant. This sub-Gaussian, it means that the tails of the noise tear off at least as fast as the Gaussian. So it's, it's, it's a reasonable assumption under many circumstances. Uh, and uh, so here, as I said, xt is often chosen based on the past xt. It's like in the bandit case. Uh, so the estimation procedures, uh, so, so there are different uh, problems associated with this setting. One is to just estimate t to star, and the other is to construct a confidence set that constants t to star with high probability. We're going to be interested in this second problem. Uh, so that's the definition of sub-Gaussianity, and like I'm just arguing that sub-Gaussianity is something that like you are familiar with even if you are not. Uh, okay. Uh, so what do we mean by this uh, honest confidence set? Uh, we mean a, a random set in Rd such that uh, like you're given some data, that's your confidence parameter, and the unknown parameter vector lies in the confidence set with probability at least one minus data. Yes? I, I may have missed something. So I thought you assumed that the noise is bounded because it has to come out to be a probability. It, it could be bounded, yeah. It's like uh, that's a special case of sub Gaussianity. I mean, and the tail no, is really nice. You defined it to be a probability. Motivation. Yeah, that was motivation. motivation. And then I'm more general. So I'm moving to something more general, slightly more general. Okay. If you have Bernoulli, not, like you have this Bernoulli random variables, then this certainly holds. Like for bounded cases, this certainly holds. It's, uh, okay, so, so we want to construct this uh, confidence set. Yes? The probability here, what is ex exactly the measurable space? I mean, you have a measurable space, and then you have all these uh, random variables that are supported on this uh, measurable space. So I'm, I'm sorry, like I didn't say that x1, xn, y1, n, y, n are the random variables. They're, they're supported on this uh, measurable space. It's not a product space, right? No, no it's no. not. No, it, it's, it's right. like these are, like these are totally correlated. These x right. are the totally correlated. Right. Uh, it's like the, 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 you could construct the space, right? Like right. based on, on all these conditions, you could construct an operator. But, but, but unlike regression where you assume that it's a product space, this is not a product space. This is not a product space. It's like not random design, not fixed design. It's like sequentially choosing co uh, cover it. So it's, it's a little bit harder if you want. Uh, but actually, it, it happens to be not much harder to, to analyze it. It's uh, a little bit harder. Uh, but you essentially get the same results. OK, uh, so, so this is what we want. Uh, and so this is just like picture about uh, showing what we want. And uh, so one approach is to design confidence sets uh, based on rich regression. So you have your data, and you stack them into these matrices, these m by d matrices, and then uh, that's x1 to n, and y1 to n is going to be just the responses stacked into vector. And then rich regression uh, with this uh, positive parameter lambda uh, would produce this estimate, and then this is going to be the center of the confidence set. And you proceed as, as usual, you define the Gramian matrix, uh, which is uh, slightly adjusted to take into account the rich parameter. And if you do that, then with some work, uh, you can prove that the following set is a confidence set, and here, What's important to remark is that this result is, is pretty cool because it holds for every time step t. So it's like up to infinity. So it's not just uh, for a finite horizon. You avoid the union bond basically using a Martingale argument. It's kind of uh, neat. We learn it from Friedman. It's a stopping time argument, yes. Hey, um, so I might be confused some way. So the, the dimension of the matrix don't seem to match. Uh, are you? So well, it's, yeah, it should be, that should be D by N, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, so obviously that, that thing is, is D by D. Oh, D by D by, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Transparency. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, 
So, so that's, that's the cool thing about this. And uh, the, the proof is based on a method of mixtures that goes back to uh, Robbins and Sigmund in the 70s. And it's kind of like using a Bayesian technique to actually prove this thing. It's, it's kind of cool technique. Uh, anyways, uh, so, so this is a confidence set. Uh, OK, so what you see here is that uh, this, this is uh, basically the distance that you're going to use later on, let's say in the banded bonds. So it's based on the Gramian matrix. So it's like it creates a, like uh, the, the, the ellipsoid is going to have a much smaller radii uh, in the directions where you see a, a lot of covariates in the, the orthogonal directions. It's, it's going to be uh, really large. It's potentially really large. And this is kind of the, the radius. Uh, OK, so here. This norm is this uh, matrix norm. OK? All right. Uh, so this extends to separable Hilbert space if you care about our cages uh, or Gaussian processes. Uh, so, so that's cool. Uh, is, it, is this a good bond? Uh, so of course, there's been tons of work in the literature about uh, producing similar bonds. For example, Donny Hayes and Kakadi in their 2008 paper uh, uh, prove this bond, uh, or proves this, uh, or show, show that this, this is a confidence set. And then what you see, the difference here, is that here there is an explicit dependence on time. So if you want to get a uniform in time behavior, then it's pretty common that you take a union bond. And here you see that that's probably a union bond. That's probably a covering argument. And here we are avoiding it uh, because we use this method of mixture that kind of just integrates out everything really nice. And then we use this stopping time argument to get rid of the union bond. And uh, so that, that's kind of neat. Uh, so the determinant of V of t could be as large as uh, like the log determinant of, uh, the determinant of V. So that could be as large as this. Uh, but you are basically shaving off one of those terms. Uh, and uh, uh, Rusmi, Fischer, and Tong, and Tsitsiklis also proved a similar bond. And you can see that qualitatively, these two bonds are similar. And our bond uh, looks uh, different. It kind of like adapts to, like, this also adapts to the structure of the Gramian matrix, which uh, you hope it, it's a good thing. Uh, so whether it's, it's a good thing or not, it's, it's not so easy to see. So uh, what you can do is that, that you, uh, well, first, uh, you can derive a regret bond for uh, the underlying optimistic argotum, yes? Bond? Yes. Uh, so you showed that your bond is done by using the linear regression. But so yeah, these are linear regression-based bonds. All all regression. Yeah, so they're, yeah. they're, the they're the same, same. yeah. <coughs> That's basically the same. The analysis is different. Okay. Well, I, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think they're the same, yeah. Assumption is different. Assumption of xt. No, 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 no. The, these guys are like we are going to like. Okay, so so here I was lazy to check uh, how to extend their bond when these norms are different. But like we have a general result. Like in our case, s is a bond on the two norm of the unknown parameter vector, and like I, I was. Just lazy not to, to calculate that S would come somehow into this bond too. And uh, the same holds here. So here here I here they have it or I, I had it, but okay. So th that's the only difference. But you could take the the common case when 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 everything is smaller than one, then S equals to one, and we'll probably yeah, that that's the that's the only thing I guess at the moment. Yeah. Okay, uh, so before uh, like we okay, you could compare this by just running some experiments, right? Uh, so before we going there, uh, if you just plug in uh, these bonds into the previous immediate regret bond for this uh, specific algorithm, and you get this regret uh, bonds for uh, stochastic uh, linear bandits, and you see that uh, the dependence on D shows up, and it's going to be linear on D, linear in D. And in the worst case, you can show that uh, the D has to be there. So it's, you cannot get rid of it. Uh, so some empirical results. Uh, are these new confidence sets any tighter than the previous one? Uh, or I would just uh, like uh, going in rounds. So uh, 
I'm going to show some um, experimental results. So here on the picture, you, what you see is that this is a regret, and uh, this is time, and uh, this is a, a bond uh, based on uh, Donny Hayes and Kakadi's paper. And what you can see is that the regret is not starting to, to curve. So it's, it's kind of like uh, almost linearly growing. If you uh, take more confidence that the regret is, is, is more gentle, it's, it's much better behavior. It kind of like curved like a root T, which is uh, what it should do. And on a picture, I'm also showing that uh, you can modify these algorithms not to switch that often uh, the arms, uh, which saves you a lot of com computation. And the regret is not going to change by much if you do that. So you can save a lot of like exponentially um, uh, many computation steps because it's enough to, uh, to recompute everything uh, logarithmically often. OK. Uh, so but are there other ways to construct confidence sets, right? These confidence sets, we see that they are, they are really important. They, they're crucial to achieve good results. Uh, in particle, can we get tighter results under sparsity, so main subject? Uh, so if you only care about the prediction error in, in a linear uh, regression setting, then uh, what you know is that if there is no sparsity, then the prediction error is going to depend linearly on the dimension. And if you have sparsity with index p, then the prediction error, the prediction error, you can replace this d by p log d, which is pretty cool. So now you can play with a uh, really large d and uh, smallish p's. <coughs> OK. Uh, so, but we also note from the literature that the least squares of each uh, estimators won't cut it. So you have to look for something new. So how do we design uh, confidence sets for this sparse case? So uh, the idea is, is to, uh, to do a, a conversion. It's, it's a reduction uh, from one problem to another. If you can solve online linear prediction with squared loss with a small regret under the sparse keys, then we claim that you're going to have very, very good confidence sets for the sparse case. Uh, and uh, that should be enough. So uh, the idea is to uh, create confidence sets based on how well you do in online linear prediction. And so uh, it's, it's pretty cool because whenever you improve something on the, the prediction side in this online adversarial setting, then you're going to improve your confidence sets uh, automatically. OK. And hopefully, it will give you good bounds for the sparse case. Yes? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm confused. So I thought the goal was linear <coughs> prediction, and the confidence sets are just a technical tool that I use inside the algorithm to get the for prediction. Those, yeah. And now you're I'm, yeah, I'm going back and forth. It seems that I'm going in circles. Yeah, yeah but not exactly. Okay, so, so no, the linear prediction problem is going to be made tougher because it's going to be adversarial. Okay, so and why adversarial? The reason it's adversarial is because, well, if you're in the bandit case, you're just pulling these arms and then they kind of like, uh, you don't really control, you don't really, like this algorithm doesn't really control like how much the, the arms are spread out they happen the way they happen to be. So you have this prediction problem where the arms could be really correlated. So uh, no, you're just going to add uh, that, OK, let's say it's, it's sparse. Like there, is, there exists a sparse predictor, which has a, a low uh, L2 uh, regret. Uh, then uh, can you turn that back into a confidence set? So it's, it's a bit thing. You will see. Like it, it, it's going to work out. Okay. Uh, so what is online linear prediction? What do I call online linear prediction? It's not anything that we talked about before. Okay, so so this is it. It's sequential uh, worst case framework. At time t, you receive a, a covariate x t. Uh, you need to produce a prediction, which is just a real number, and you receive the correct label or the correct response y of t. Okay, and you suffer this quadratic loss. That's it. That's the whole thing, OK? And we didn't say anything about whether there is any statistical relationship between the x t's, the y t's, and so on and so forth. There is no statistical assumption here. OK, this is a worst case framework. Uh, and you want to compete with the best linear predictor in hindsight, OK? Because there is no other thing you could do, right? Because there are no statistical assumptions here. 
Uh, so there are heaps uh, of algorithms for this problem, starting with all kind of gradient descent algorithms, mirror descent would be another example, online least squares, exponentiated gradient algorithms, online loss. So, and then there is this algorithm that uh, not, probably not many people know about, but it's actually uh, a simple uh, adaptation of continuous exponential weight algorithm for this setting. Okay, it's just continuous exponential weights. Uh, uh, the abbreviation stands for sequential, and, and that's for the sparse case. That's why the SE is there, sparse uh, exponential weights. So basically, you, you use exponential weights algorithm with some prior which uh, prefer sparsity. Okay. Uh, so online linear prediction. So what's the regret? So the regret, and I'm going to use a different letter to, uh, to denote it, is, is, is this quantity. Uh, so the regret against a parameter vector t, theta, sorry, is uh, the total loss that you suffer versus the total loss that you could have suffered if you use this parameter vector in every time step to, to make up your prediction. But there is no restriction that you should uh, stick to some parameter vector t in your, your prediction. Uh, like, you don't have to do that. Like, you can produce the predictions in any ways. Okay. Uh, so you're in an agnostic setting. Uh, so all of these prediction algorithms that we talked about come with some regret bonds. So what's, what's a regret bond? It guarantees that under, uh, no, no matter how the data is selected, which is the xt's and the yt's, the algorithm is granted to have a regret that is below some quantity b of m, which you can either compute from data or just from a prior information that could be like, how big these covariate vectors could be, how big, big the y of t could be, and so on and so forth. So uh, there are different uh, kind of bonds in the literature. Uh, there are bonds uh, that people are trying to study how fast you can learn that only depend on like the magnitudes of things that are coming in. And there are bonds that depend on the data, so data-dependent bonds. For us, data-dependent bonds are going to be a little bit better because we are going to use these bonds to actually design our confidence set. So if you have a tighter regret bond, uh, the only thing that we require is that like you come up with an algorithm, you have a regret bond, the regret bond should be computable based on known quantities. That's it. And then uh, like we will turn the wheels and then that will uh, speed out the confidence set. Okay, so typical results in the literature show that uh, the regret uh, is either of root n or of uh, size log of n. If you exploit the curvature of the squared loss, then uh, you can work a little bit harder and, and get this type of regret bonds. If you kind of like throw away that information, then you typically end up uh, getting a root n regret. Okay, uh, so before we do a reduction, let's uh, look into uh, another reduction uh, that was done uh, previously uh, um, by other people. Uh, so the question here, whether small regret implies small risk. So you might be familiar with this result. It's kind of a cool introductory result, or like why these reductions make sense. Uh, so let's say you're interested in a statistical problem where you have IID data, okay, and you want to do linear predictions. So you have XT, I, XT of YT that's IID, and you assume that YT is just uh, linear related to the XTs. And you choose an online learning algorithm A that produces a sequence of estimates and, and makes this prediction. So this algorithm is special because the predictions are are based on this parameter vectors. Not all algorithms do that. And you have a regret bond. What can we say about like how well can we uh, uh, predict, uh, like how small a risk can we achieve? Okay, so what's the, the risk of a vector theta? So the risk of a vector theta is uh, the expected squared error, where the expectation of, uh, is uh, about the, uh, the joint distribution of xt and yt. So these guys prove that if you take uh, the average of the vectors produced by this online learning algorithm, then with, for any delta between 0 and 1 with probability 1 minus delta, the risk of this uh, averaged vector 
with that high probability is going to be bounded by, and the main term here is uh, Bn divided by n. So if you have an algorithm that has a regret of log n, then you have a log n divided by n risk. So it's kind of like you can turn an online algorithm into an algorithm that has a small uh, risk. So that's, that's another reduction. So online learning is, is powerful. So that's uh, kind of where we started. And so how are we going to use an online algorithm to produce a confidence set? And, uh, and that's done uh, here. So we have this data where right now we don't assume, don't make this uh, IID assumption, but we, we can have XT uh, sequentially generated, but YT is related to XT as uh, before in this linear manner. And we have an algorithm A, an online learning algorithm, that we're going to feed with this data, XT and YT, and it produces these predictions Y hat of T, okay? Uh, and it comes with a regret bound, okay? against this unknown parameter vector theta star, uh, so the regret bound is Bn. Uh, then you can show that the following set, this set, is a high probability confidence set. And that's a uniform high probability confidence set for all, all times. So what's in this set? Uh, so it's kind of like an ellipsoidal shaped set again. Uh, you have this uh, quality quantity and you say that this quality quantity cannot be larger than, than this. So you take all the parameter vectors for this quality quantities below this, this other set. So you can see that like, if you would expand this, the Gramian would come in. It has the same, exact same flavor as, as the previous confidence sets. Okay? So the shape is, is going to be like, uh, it's not uh, surprising, it's, it's, it's exactly the same shape. Uh, apparently, what uh, you see, what, what's different here is that this, this radius type of quantity right now depends on the regret of the algorithm. If you design an algorithm, which is a smaller regret, this B of n goes down, okay? Then you have a much smaller confidence set. So here notice that you're summing n terms. So if you worry about this one, like that's too big, no, it's, it's actually not too big because here you have n terms that you're comparing to just a constant. Or if b of n is log n, then you're just comparing to uh, log n, which means the confidence set is actually shrinking. Okay. So, so why are you using uh, the y has the, uh, the predictions in defining a confidence set? Because that's how we can do it. But you can, what you're actually observing is the y t. Well, uh, you have this algorithm A that produces those predictions, so you actually do observe those too, right? So you take this algorithm for this online setting, it produces these predictions, and then you build your, uh, if that, so the, the, the idea is that if that algorithm is so good in predicting things, like we can use what it predicts. So it's kind of like, this is the filtered version, if you want, of Y of T, right? So it's, it's kind of like you're reducing the noise by, uh, by using the predictions of the algorithm. It's like, it, it looks a little bit dangerous because it's not the actual data, but you have to trust that algorithm. That algorithm actually uses y of t, and you're indirectly using y of t by looking at y hat of t. Okay. So that's, that's how it works. And the proof, uh, it's just one slide. Uh, so if you take the definition of the regret, it compared uh, your loss uh, with uh, the loss that you could have achieved uh, if you use theta star in every time step, and that was bounded by B of n. You have this quadratic expression, you do the expansion, you do the algebra, and then from the, the regret bond, just by algebra, you derive this, okay? And you see that this quantity is what, what appears uh, in the confidence set, you have the B of N, and then you have this other guy. And that guy is just a martingale, okay? Because here, you have the noise that multiplies these other things, which are measurable based on the past. So you have to analyze that martingale, and as long as you're done with that, you're done. So that's it, okay? So you use uh, standard techniques to analyze the martingale, and then you get your confidence set. It's like, okay, it's a little bit of calculation. It's five pages. Okay, so uh, if we combine this, uh, like how, how can we get uh, good confidence sets uh, for the sparse case? Well, we need an algorithm uh, that achieves small regret uh, in the sparse case. And we should get, we sh 
we, we need an algorithm that achieves a log n regret because if you have a root n regret, uh, then your confidence set would be just too large. So you have, you have to have an algorithm that achieves log n regret and which adapts to or, or exploits the sparsity of the unknown parameter vector. And uh, this algorithm by Gerchinovitz uh, that was published in 2011, which is based on earlier ideas of Dalian and, and Sibakov actually does it. And it's, it's a pretty like, simple to describe algorithm. Uh, so the idea is that uh, you have uh, the parameter space and uh, that's the Euclidean space. You put a prior there, which is going to be like kind of like a habitat distribution that kind of prefers sparsity. And then uh, you uh, basically take the uh, continuous exponential weight target term. That means that you kind of like deriving these posteriors uh, where the data is, is just this Gaussians. And, uh, and uh, you sample from the posterior, or you compute the, the expected prediction based, based on the posterior. That's kind of the same thing. And uh, they show that uh, with, with a not too difficult analysis that the regret of this algorithm is actually scaling with p log n d, where p is the sparsity of uh, the vector theta, and, and n is the number of fronts, and d is the mbn dimension. And so it's a corollary, you get this, uh, this confidence set. So just plug in, in the previous inequality. So you will see that P appears there and D appears there. So that's kind of promising because D doesn't appear linearly as before. Okay, so if you apply this to, uh, to bandits, uh, what do we get? Uh, there, there is a very general, uh, like because of this reduction, if, uh, a general result that like if you have any online prediction algorithm with a regret of B of N, then you get this regret for the stochastic bandit problem, the associated stochastic bandit problem. Okay, so here you can see that well, root d and b n appears, and then b n appears in a polylog term. So we don't worry about that. This might be a little bit worrisome, but we are going to come back to that. So if you plug in uh, the regret result of Gatchinovit, then what you see is that your regret is going to scale with root p d n. So it's Okay, so as previous, previously it was scaling with d times root n, so we replaced the d by root p d, which is uh, an improvement, but it's probably not uh, what, what everyone was hoping for, which is that you can get totally uh, rid of uh, the dependence on d, and uh, uh, the regret is going to depend on d only through the polylog terms. Uh, so that didn't happen, so can we do better? Actually, the answer, unfortunately, is that uh, under these conditions, you can't do any better. Uh, so there is a lower bound, which is based on an other paper uh, where uh, they studied uh, bandits in an adversarial setting. Uh, and, and the lower bound goes as follows. You take this decision set, which is basically all the unit vectors, and then there is a one uh, as a first component. And you pick some epsilon, uh, which, is, which happens to be of uh, uh, square root of d over n. And you, uh, the unknown parameter vector uh, is going to be any of uh, the following d parameter vectors. So the first component is fixed to 0 0.5. And you have an epsilon at the ice component. So basically, uh, here, the sparsity is 2. And if you want to play in this game, you have to guess like where is the little epsilon, okay? So you have to find the epsilon. Epsilon is positive, so you want reward. Uh, and uh, so the standard result goes that if you take the, the stochastic bandit problem where uh, the y uh, is going to be Bernoulli uh, with uh, inner product of, uh, with parameter as the inner product of the, the vector chosen and, and theta, then the regret of any bandit algorithm on, on this uh, problem is uh, at least root uh, dn, okay? So what you see is that the root d is never going to get away. It's never going to go away, okay? So no matter what sparsity you're talking about, this is a very sparse problem, okay? Uh, so there is a result uh, which considers this uh, alternate noise model uh, where the parameter is perturbed in every time step, and there is a, a strong assumption about uh, 
that this has to be an IID noise, meaning that the components are uncorrelated or independent of each other, and they are zero mean. And if you do this, uh, and, and let's say your decision set is uh, the unit ball, so it has like large vectors in it, all kind of directions, then there is an ergotum that achieves a, a better regret. So, so this uh, result is due to Carpentier and Remy Munoz, Alexander Carpentier and Remy Munoz. Uh, this was concurrent to result. Uh, so if you are willing to, uh, to make further assumptions, then you can improve the situation whether this set of assumptions or some other set of assumptions are, are going to be the one that, that uh, you care about is, is another question. Okay, uh, so back to your results. Uh, do we actually improve empirically? Uh, well, we generated some uh, artificial problem where you have two, uh, 200 dimensions and the sparsity is, is 10, so only 10 vectors are non-zero. And uh, that's uh, shown the action, action set and, and you have some noise. And what you can see is that if you, uh, if you don't apply this reduction result, just apply least squares, then the regret is not going to change at any time soon. And if you apply this uh, reduction result, then, then you get a much uh, gentler behavior uh, on this problem. Okay, so you gain something. Uh, so in summary, we consider sparse stochastic bandits and the main tool uh, was this online to confidence at conversion tool. And uh, we think that this is the first confidence test for sparse linear predictions uh, under general, quite general conditions. We got good empirical results. There are other results that I didn't talk about uh, on this uh, Yahoo News article recommendation competition that Lee Hong organized a while ago. Uh, and uh, in terms of future work, uh, uh, so currently I'm looking at designs for other problems like matrix prediction where you can just adapt the framework and it seems that everyone, uh, every, every step goes through. So there doesn't seem to be uh, any major difficulty there. Uh, and uh, the, one of the, the challenging questions is uh, whether you can uh, adapt to unknown sparsity. So in, uh, we don't know the answer to this, uh, but uh, if you would ask me, I would say probably no, unfortunately. Uh, so there are other interesting questions like when the action set has a few extreme points, then least curve means, and can you design algorithms that automatically takes into account things like that and achieves the best of both results in all cases. And uh, this algorithm that I, I talked about, uh, this uh, uh, algorithm that is based on continuous exponential weights uh, is, is pretty expensive, although the the author says that, well, they can run it for tens of thousands of dimensions. It requires sampling, approximate computations. Uh, so the question is whether you can get away with uh, cheaper algorithms. In the experiments, we didn't use this algorithm. We used exponential gradient, which is a cheaper algorithm, which comes with a worse regret bond. But we were careful to use the best data-dependent regret bonds. And then th that's, that's where we were winning. Uh, so the question whether other algorithms, uh, you know, exploiting the special properties of bandits was also cut, uh, cut this, uh, well, I don't know. And uh, lastly, the, the real question is whether there is a trade-off between uh, computation and, and statistical efficiency or, or the rate at which you are learning. Uh, so these days, uh, there is a lot of uh, results that appear in this direction. And of course, you can ask the, the same question here. Uh, you can relate these problems to other problems that uh, we start to uh, have some knowledge about and then you can hope to be able to study this problem in a formal uh, fashion. So far what we have observed is that well, you can have like cheaper algorithms like loss like algorithms which come with crappy regret bonds and then okay so uh, the, your regret uh, seems to go up if you use an algorithm which is uh, cheaper to run and if you have a more expensive algorithm which uh, maybe doesn't even have, doesn't even uh, admit any uh, polynomial time complexity bonds, uh, then you can get much better results. Uh, so the question is whether this trade-off is, is real. All right, uh, so thank you.
the confidence uh, set for this last time. Okay. Here's this one. So, um, how do you how do you actually use this when you choose the uh, the C in the bandit? So as I said, like if you have finitely many actions, then for each of the actions, uh, you need to find the theta vector that maximizes the inner product with that action. Okay? So the theta vector that lies in, inside this uh, confidence ellipsoid, so that's a, uh, that's a quadratically constrained linear optimization problem. Actually, you can compute it in closed form. It, it entails uh, inverting a matrix. You can do an SVD, and then once you do an SVD, then you're done. OK. Thank you. Uh, any questions? OK, so we'll do it now. Thanks, Mr.